Hi, welcome to the Capital Coffee Connection. I am Liz hirschnoff tolly and I am very excited to have you here today because we have an amazing guest. One of the reasons why I love this podcast is because I get to meet new people who are leaders, and we do not talk about politics and policy, but rather we are talking about the heart, the humanity, the home, where they came from, and what made them who they are today. I'm really excited to have Sarah here. Sarah McBride is currently a state senator in Delaware, and she is running for the U.S. Congress for the seat that currently Lisa Blood Rochester has, and Lisa is running for Senate now. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was preparing this was that you are the first of many things. You've done a lot of firsts. And it's interesting because Delaware is the first nation to have ratified the Constitution. And so in its nickname is the first state. So I thought that was kind of appropriate that you are from the first state and you have done a lot of firsts. And we're going to learn a lot about them today. But I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining me. And I look forward to learning more about you. And I'm excited for this conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here to, today, too. One of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, if we take away the title and we just look at each other and we could be having coffee at a, a coffee shop anywhere in the world, and we're just talking person to person. We have so much more in common than what sometimes separates us by titles or by party status or things like that. So I hope through this conversation that we just really have it as free flowing and that we just enjoy our conversation. So one of the things that I talked about in the beginning is that you're a first of many. Three things that I kind of pulled out was that you are the first transgender state senator in Delaware and in the United States. You are the first transgender woman to or transgender person to speak at a convention and you spoke at the 2016 democratic convention i was there and i remember actually and that moment that historical moment and when you win this race you will be the first u.s congress person who is transgender what does that mean and what else am i missing that you're the first of I mean, it is absolutely incredible that I am living a life that would have seemed so impossible to me as a kid that it was almost incomprehensible. I pinch myself every single day. And, you know, in many ways, I think I am forever hopeful in part because my life in this moment is an impossibility. And for me, Whenever I have this opportunity to be a, a first, a lot of people will ask, well, there's there, there's so many burdens that come with being a first. There's so many responsibilities that come with it. And there are definitely extra responsibilities, but it is a reflection of the fact that that I am I am lucky. I'm lucky to have these opportunities as a trans person. And I don't think that you should have to be lucky to have these opportunities. And so one of the things that Vice President Harris always talks about is that while she may be a first, she can't be a last. Yeah. And for me, my my goal in, in these opportunities is one, to take stock in the fact that I am living a life that I never dreamed was possible. I take stock in the luck that I have had within this community that I'm a part of to have these opportunities. But more than that, I do feel a, a responsibility to make sure that I'm not just leaving a Sarah-sized hole in the wall. Right that I'm using those positions and those those roles to bring down the barriers that stand in the way of not just trans people, but anyone who's been excluded from fully participating in our democracy or, or pursuing their dreams to be able to ensure that they have a, a clear path moving forward. And I know for me that the best way for me to do that is to just do the best job that I can in those roles, to be the best state senator, to be the best member of Congress that I can be and show that trans people are multidimensional human beings who not only love and laugh, hope and dream, fear and cry like everyone else, but also can do a really good job in the roles that we're in. I think about that, like what I was saying at the beginning, if we didn't talk about it and people just saw us speaking, they wouldn't know who I was or who you were. They would just see two women having a conversation. And the minute you put down, you know, backgrounds or who people are, which is fair, and that's part of a conversation, people can start judging. Yeah. And and so I think that when you talk about that transgender people can do all these things, of course they can, but there has been there have been barriers. So you're breaking them. And 
one of the things that I like to talk about is like where you come from. And obviously you're from Wilmington, Delaware, and you grew up in five people household, yep. mother and father. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your parents, a little bit about your brothers, but like in that context, what it felt like to grow up, because I know you had struggles back yeah. then, which I think gave you a resilience so that you could be who you are today. I grew up three blocks from where I live right now in the district I now represent. My parents still live in the same house that I was born and raised in. And I always say I lucked out in the parent lottery. My dad is, he's an attorney, but on top of that, he is brilliant and compassionate and funny. My mom is smart and goofy and <laughs> unbelievably committed. She's one of the most, they're, they're both incredibly determined and tireless individuals when they set their minds to something. You know, despite the fact that I struggled as a young person and I was in the closet, I consider myself really fortunate that I knew from as early as I can remember knowing that I was trans, I can remember thinking my parents are going to struggle with this, but I don't ever have to fear that they won't love me because of this, because they are just open hearted and and open minded people that I'm really, really proud to consider not just parents, but two of my best friends. And then I also have two older brothers, eight and 10 years older than me. So I'm, I'm sort of a mix between the youngest and an only child. Right. Two older brothers who uh, are amazing. One is an attorney in Delaware. He is uh, at the Department of Justice and heads up the Division of Civil Rights and Public Trust in the State Department of Justice. My other brother is a radiation oncologist up here in New York, actually, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And in many ways, my oldest brother, the, the doctor who was openly gay, was sort of a trailblazer in our family because I watched, I watched when I was... 11, 12, 13, 14, my brother coming out and my family, not just enveloping him with love, but the person he was dating at the time who has become his husband and the father to their three wonderful kids. And I think it, it gave me permission to begin to grapple with my own gender identity. You know, as, as wonderful as my childhood was, as broadly speaking, as happy as I was as a kid, I always had a smile on my face. I knew from a young age that not only that I was different, I, I knew when I was five or six that I was a girl. I didn't know why or how, but I knew. Right. And I didn't know that there was anything I could do about it. I didn't know that there was anyone else like me. And so I would go to sleep at night praying that the universe would intervene and I would just wake up as myself. But obviously that never came. What did come was the realization that, that this is an experience that other people have. But it also came in the context of a of a TV show with a guest character whose character was revealed to be trans during the course of the episode. It was a comedy called Just Shoot Me. Okay. And it, by the standards of 1999, 2000, 2001, it wasn't particularly egregiously offensive in, in its portrayal of a trans person. But that was that's partly a byproduct of the fact that everything back then, it was either, you know, the story was either the, a dead body in a drama or a punchline in a comedy when it was a trans character. And during the course of this episode, as it was revealed that the character who was beautiful was trans, every time someone would express any kind of interest in her, the laugh track would cue. And at 10, you don't know a lot, but you know you don't want to be a joke. And so I buried my gender identity deep inside. And I told myself that if I could do good and be good and make my family proud, that perhaps those things would fill the void in my life and heal the pain, which, you know, I think one of the challenges that we have in conversations around trans people is that unlike sexual orientation, where pretty much everyone understands what it feels like to love and to lust, most people don't have an analogous experience to what it feels like to be trans and in the closet. And for me, the closest that that pain comes to was just this constant feeling of homesickness. Yeah. And which I don't think most people can understand it, it, if you don't have it. You, you, you can't. I mean, most people understand what it feels like to be homesick. Right. And they understand sort of the. But the, not in it, that same internal deep. Right. Not in not with that depth. And I think it becomes hard to jump into a person's lived experience if you don't have that kind of right. analogous experience. Right. And so it was a, a life of, of, of 
you know, in many ways, joy and wonderful opportunities, but also just this constant, constant, almost all consuming and eventually all consuming. But it gave you some resilience. It gave you something that gave you the ability because when you decided to announce and come out, you were still young. You were in college. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I learned is that you were student body president at American University. When you decided to come out was at the end of your term. But the interesting thing was, and this is what I wanted to talk about, was that you really didn't know people would stick by you. And it's that vulnerability that you took a big chance on. And and talk about that because I think you were surprised yeah. with how people embraced you after. You know, in many ways, in order for me to come out, I had to go through a grieving process. I went through a, a process of grieving really any kind of future for myself. And when I finally accepted the loss of any kind of future, I was able to accept myself. Mm -hmm. I had so built up in my mind that people wanted to be my friend because they thought I was going to do good things yes. that I was a fe I was very fearful that if and when I came up came out and I will admit this underestimated everyone in my life but I feared that if if and when I came out they would go well this person has no future and therefore drop you drop me I had gotten involved in politics. You know, the, the governor of the state, Jack Markell, had mentored me. Bo Biden had mentored me. You know, they sort of signaled that I was someone they wanted to see do something with my life. And so I, I basically gave up on on that future. I gave up on being involved in politics, of doing work I love, finding love, living in a community I love. To your question, I came out publicly and shared my story because I knew that people would talk, right? People would gossip. I was student body president. And I did know that in damage control, you want to get your news out on your own terms in your own words. And I shared my story. And it was really the first opportunity that I saw that vulnerability can be really powerful. And that, that people are fundamentally good, decent, empathetic people. And when they have the opportunity to see someone be vulnerable... And and be authentic. It gives them permission to be vulnerable and authentic, but it, it taps in to their ca compassion and their empathy, and it changes the way they respond. And it's one of the reasons why I think just in life, there's so much power in proximity. Because when we are proximate to one another, when, when people of different backgrounds and experiences are in our, our lives, we recognize the fundamental commonalities we have and the shared humanity we have. And that was the first experience seeing the response that I got to that, to my coming out note was the first experience that I, re where I realized that really the path to justice often comes through vulnerability and public vulnerability. And I also, I agree, but I also think there are certain people that are braver and are willing to take a chance. Others then can follow, but it does take somebody that is willing to not only be vulnerable, but has courage and the bravery because you could fail, you could not yeah. go, but you still you still do that leap of faith, and a lot of people don't have that. And you've given other people who are coming who are coming up after that you've made the break. And it goes back to like it's not just about you, Sarah. It's about what you can do, and then others can follow, and they can see your path. And especially young people throughout the country that may not have had parents who are as understanding, or not a community that has been understanding, but still to understand. The path you forged was not easy. I actually think that that, that is 100%. When I talk about feeling lucky, that is actually one of the reasons why I keep doing what I'm doing because I, I think it's going to be really hard for whomever is a first. Yeah. And I'm lucky that I have this safety net that will allow me to, sh to shoulder the attacks and, and the yeah. extra responsibilities that someone else might not. And so if not me, who? A lot of times I ask people which teachers inspired them, but mm -hmm. I'm skipping that. Okay. Because I really want to know, you worked for two very impressive men and in in Delaware. And I would love to know what it is that they gave you, like what it is that Governor Markell gave to you as a young person, as a leader, and, and encouraging you to continue to do what you do. But also, what was that special chemistry or special advice that he gave to you because I know you worked on a lot of stuff with regards to gender equality. Yeah. I remember the the first thing that that 
sort of drew me to Jack Markell. He was the state treasurer in Delaware at the time, and there were rumors he was going to run for governor. And the first thing that really drew me to him was just his warm smile. It just seemed so authentic and and like such a safe space for me as a 13-year-old kid volunteering, intimidated by all these all these adults and all these elected officials. He was he was just truly kind and his smile and the warmth of his smile communicated that he actually saw me mm-hmm. and wanted to 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 get to know me as a person. And and I think anyone who's worked with Jack will tell you that that he is one of the most genuine people and he will you have a conversation with him three years later, he will remember every detail of that conversation. I mean, it it is, he internalizes who people are in such a really profound and authentic way. But I think for me, you know, first off, he opened a lot of doors for me. I am incredibly lucky that he gave me opportunities and saw in me maybe something that I wouldn't have known was there. I think he, he gave me a confidence that I could be up to jobs like this. He believed in me. And and I think, again, when I was in the process of coming out, I, I knew how wonderful he was. But I worried that folks who had mentored me would, would, would stop believing in me. But I think more than anything else, what he reinforced for me was just how important grace and dignity and being sort of big, the bigger person, how important that is in leadership, how understanding other people, giving them the benefit of the doubt. You would always say you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you're supposed yes. to speak, which I don't always follow. But he sort of, it, it's that grace and, and, and dignity that he has... I, every single day I ask myself, what would what would Jack do in this context? And the answer is just always, what is the kindest thing to do? What is the what is the the most compassionate thing to do? What is the thing that you will be proud of no matter how it turns out that you responded in this way? So I you know, I try to be when when I'm in a contested election and opponents announce, I'll reach out to the opponent to congratulate them on a big day. That's the type of of, of approach that Jack would always bring, just being the bigger person. And for for Bo, yeah, talk about Bo Biden because I know you worked with with him, and he was the attorney general. Yeah, so Joe Biden always talks about Bo as as Joe without any of the negative parts. Not that our president has any negative parts, but he was exceptional. He was the real deal. He was smart and kind but not in ways where he ever thought too highly of himself. I mean, he was born in an environment where for almost his entire adult life, his father was not only the United States Senator from Delaware, but this national figure. And he never had a chip on his shoulder. He never thought he was better than anyone else. And even even more importantly, I think he was exactly the same person when we were in the car driving to an event, just the two of us, as he was out in the public what you saw was what you got. And it was just a genuineness. He was just a decent is the best word I can think of decent person. And I think that authenticity, right. And that consistency of character across circumstance, regardless of what the power dynamics are, that consistency of character um, to me is how every person who considers himself progressive should be, you know, a lot of times, We'll see people in the news who are progressive icons, but you know they don't treat their staff well, or you know they don't treat people who you know are in their office particularly well. And I think that that's, I don't think you can call yourself a true progressive if you don't live the values that you're fighting for at work in your own life. And Bo did that. So talk a little bit, we're not here about politics and policy, but you did do some incredible work with Delaware's Gender Identity Non-Discrimination Act. Can you explain what that is? Because I don't think that's politics and policy, by the way. I think that's just humanity. That's right. That's right. So, you know, after I after I came out, my my dream was always to come back to Delaware. And at that point, Delaware was one of the majority of states, which is still true to this day, that did not have clear protections from discrimination for trans people. 
So it was under state law legal to fire us, deny us housing, kick us out of a restaurant simply because of our gender identity. And that is true to this day in most states and at the federal level. We've, we've made some progress in the courts that have interpreted sex protections to include LGBTQ people, but it, we still don't have clear protections from discrimination. But at that point in 2013, it was arguably entirely legal to discriminate against a trans person. And I was afraid of coming home to a state where that kind of discrimination could lurk legally around any corner. And so I began working with Jack. I remember one of the first conversations we had after I came out, he asked me, do, do I want to come home? Do I want to come back to Delaware? Because Delaware is actually, based on surveys, the second gayest state in the nation. But it's not known as the sort of mecca uh, for, for LGBTQ people in the same way that big cities often right. are. But he said, do you, do you, you, know, you want to come home or do you want to live in D.C. or New York? And I said, I want to come home, but I'm scared to come home. I'm scared to live in a place where that discrimination is, is, is so possible. And he just said, well, let's change that. And within seven or eight months of that conversation, we were meeting in his office with Equality Delaware. I was on the board. And at that point, we wanted to pass both marriage equality and this trans rights bill. And there had been so many states that had tried to pass both marriage and trans rights in the same year. They'd go to their legislature. They'd say, we want to pass both of these issues through the legislature. And legislators would come back and say, that's one gay bill too many. Pick one and you have to wait for the other. And, and typically, particularly in that day and age, marriage w- would win out. It was the sexier issue. It was there was more money around it. There was more attention on it. And I remember sitting in Jack's office in early 2013 as we approached him about the strategy to pass both. And not only did Jack say, hold your horses, that's that's a little bit too much. Every time the conversation would get too focused on marriage, Jack would bring it back to trans rights. And because of his support, clear support throughout that effort, We were able to become the first state in the nation, the only state in the nation, to pass both marriage equality and a trans rights bill, not just in the same year, but within weeks of each other. And I think for me, it was the the first opportunity where I had to see this this hope I had in the possibilities in our in our politics and our government. Those hopes be fulfilled. And it just it was a formative experience that's left me really motivated to say Big, small states can do big things and that there are not too many issues for us to tackle. We have to tackle them all. Just briefly, because I, I just want you to be able to explain to people what the human rights campaign is. Sure. Because I don't think people know what the human rights campaign is. Does. Yeah. So the human rights campaign, HRC, which I served as their national right. spokesperson for a while, is the nation's largest LGBTQ equal rights organization. It's fighting for both lived and legal equality across the country for LGBTQ people. So it's working on passing non-discrimination protections, but it's also working on cultural change. It's working on opening hearts and changing minds. It's working on advancing inclusive policies in the business world or in hospitals or in, in, in our schools. And it's the organization with that blue background with the yellow equal sign on it, which is how most people know it. And the reason why it's called the Human Rights Campaign and not anything else, not something more LGBTQ specific, is because back when it was founded in the early 80s, it was so stigmatized to even be supportive of LGBTQ rights that they had to pick this generic name. So if you were supporting the organization, the postal worker who was delivering your mail wouldn't know that it was an LGBTQ group. Your neighbor who might see your mail if you're in an apartment building wouldn't know. Your parents or your children, that people wouldn't know. What year was it? So in the 80s, in the 80s. And it's grown into, I think, one of the most effective equal rights organizations in, in the world. Yes. In 2018, you wrote a book. And I read it very quickly because I really wanted to know about you. And it was fascinating. And, and it's a good, and it's not, I'm not saying easy because it's there's tough stuff in it, but it's an easy read, meaning it's very digestible. It's called Tomorrow Will Be Different, Love, Loss, and the Fight for Trans Equality. And I know that you wrote it yourself. Could you talk a little bit about that process and just briefly like what it means to you so that if somebody is listening to this and they want to pick up this book, what they're going to learn from it? First off, writing a, writing a memoir is always difficult. And I point out, writing a memoir at 30, how old I was, you? I was 
27. Okay, when I read the memoir, memoir 27, 27. It's just, you know, a little bit cute. Or yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was like, I was like, oh, I'm a little insufferable <laughs> that yeah. I'm writing a memoir at this age. But memoir part one. Yeah. But I, I always say I, I had a lot of life in, in particularly those, those years between 2012 when I came out and, and 2018 when I wrote the book. Because it was not just the story of my coming out, it was not just the story of my advocacy, but more than anything else, it was a love story about my relationship with with my late husband, Andy, who has left me profoundly changed in so many ways and was, you know, I talk about Jack Jack and Bo, but no one has impacted me more than, than Andy. And it was the story of my caregiving of him, the story of our romance, the story of his to talk about bravery and perseverance in the face of terminal yeah. cancer that I shared in that book. I think one, it is incredibly important to understand that he was a trans man. I'm a trans woman that trans people are people. And, and that story I think is a, a, a tragic example of that. Um, a beautiful example of that in other ways. But I wrote the book, more than anything else, because it was right after Donald Trump's election. And for me, my experience over those years was a journey back to hope, including the loss of Andy. It was it was the most beautiful, tragic thing that I had ever seen, because what I saw in those years was not only change that I thought was impossible becoming reality, but also what I saw in the depths of those years, the, the darkest points in those years, is that all of us, all of us can bear witness to acts of amazing grace and that hope as an emotion, as a phenomenon, it only makes sense in the face of hardship. Yeah. And so in this moment, what, after Donald Trump's election and, and, and just a level of hopelessness and despair that I think so many of us were feeling, I wanted to provide people a, a, a not only pathway to advocacy and not only a pathway to empathy for trans folks, but more than anything else, a pathway back to hope that not only is change possible, but that it's often in our biggest challenges as individuals and as a country, a humanity, that we take our biggest steps forward. First, I would like to say this, which is what you and Andy shared in four years. Many people never have it in their lifetime. Um, it, 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 it's really a beautiful story. And I know, one, how much that it was really for you and for him, this this ability to actually move forward in this trans world and to understand you had each other's back. But I, I loved what you wrote that he taught you that every day matters when it comes to building a world where every person can live their life to the fullest. And even though it was short, you both lived your lives together to the fullest. And I just love how like in your vows, it wasn't, you know, you kept it about, I will always love you. And yeah, that is 100% true. For, for those who, who haven't read it, we he was diagnosed with cancer. He got great health care. He had health insurance. We both had access to flexibility with our employer that allowed us to focus on the full-time job of him, hopefully getting care that would save his life and me to focus on loving him and caring for him. And when he found out that his cancer was terminal, our friends and family organized this wedding for us, which we had four or five days before his passing. And as I wrote the service with the clergy member, Bishop Gene Robinson, who officiated, I went through and took out till death do us part and replaced it with forever and ever. And to your point, I, not only do I think about Andy every day, not only do I, I ask myself, you know, like with Jack, what would Andy do in various circumstances? And the answers are very similar for both of them because they're both just decent, kind people. But also what I'm doing now is so focused on carrying on his legacy. So his passion was expanding access to healthcare for people. And now I have the privilege of serving as the chair of our health committee in the Senate. And again, we both were able to spend this precious time together because we had some form of paid leave in through a formal policy, me through the fav grace and favor of, of my employer. And so in the legislature, I introduced and passed paid family and medical leave really as a, a love letter to Andy and an effort to carry on his work and his legacy. Okay, I'm going to switch to just a few questions for people to get to know you. Sure. Because, I mean, through our conversation, I think people have really gotten to know who you are. Uh, what is your favorite sound? 
I don't know if you've ever heard of misophonia, but I have a hard time with like staccato repetitive sounds. So I live by the sounds of a box fan constantly. If I put on a YouTube video of a box fan, I can go to sleep instantly. And so I would say the, my favorite sound is a box fan Okay. Um, I'm going to try that one. Uh, what is your favorite color? Blue. Favorite smell? Well, I think the like public answer is walking into a, a home with a home-cooked me- meal being being cooked. But I think for me, I used to play all the time in my parents' basement as a kid. And so the smell of a musty basement brings back certain it's memories for me is like yeah. I just yeah it's feel it um it's very comforting okay exercise do you do exercise okay if you, I want to okay well I aspire to running for running for the congress is exercise. yeah yeah exactly okay. yeah I don't I don't I don't run each day I run for office yeah. okay that's fair if you could have one meal on a desert island uh, what would that be I love fried food so deeply so probably fried chicken which probably wouldn't be good on a deserted island but fried chicken okay but this is your dessert island so you can have i can have whatever i want yeah what is your favorite household chore does going grocery shopping count is that a household chore i i consider it a chore okay okay so grocery shopping if you consider it a chore if not it would be the one in the house i i love tidying up but i need company to tidy up so I always have to have company over, but I actually really like tidying up. Okay. What is your superpower? I mentioned sort of an unyielding, unending hopefulness, which is different than optimism because optimism can change based on the chance of success. But I think I'm unendingly hopeful. I also think I really value finding commonality with people. Well, I think that's something that you have done, obviously, to get where you are because it hasn't been easy. What if you could travel to some place in the world? Where would that be that you haven't been? I haven't been. India. Why India? First off, I think it's an incredibly, I mean, it's a country of many different cultures and, and wide diversity, but I think it's a country of incredible history, incredible beauty and diversity, a vibrant culture. And I also think I went to South Africa several years ago and immersing myself in the anti-apartheid movement and stories of particularly the 80s and 90s of bringing down the apartheid regime was incredibly inspiring to me. And I think I would really appreciate going to India and learning more about um, Mahatma Gandhi and the efforts to overthrow British colonialism. Interesting. Interesting. So we are... We've talked, and unfortunately, we, I could sit and talk to you for hours. But the last question that I've been asking folks, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, what is joy? And what brings you joy? And how through your joy do you share that with others? And I think you've talked about it. And I want to share with you that one of the pieces, I'm skipping around, but in your book was this little girl named Lulu at the end. Mm-hmm. And she asked you... What was the question she asked What well, my favorite thing about being trans is. Yeah. And I just thought like that was joyful. I just wanted to, yes. I'm, I'm not answering for you, but it made me think about this little girl who could look up to you and you could share. And so I think that through whatever you're doing and joy, she was able to. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to take anything, but I'm give away the book either. But that was a really beautiful moment. It was. And I think. The first thing that came to my mind, first off, I think joy is so incredibly important. It's one of the reasons why I love Lisa Blunt Rochester, who's in this seat right now running for the U.S. Senate, because I always call her a joyful warrior. And I think in order to grow our ranks of allies, joy is such a critical essence of inviting people in. But I think fundamentally, the the thing that comes to my mind of what joy is, is it's, it's a reflection that you have found home whether it's home in yourself, whether it's home in a space. And I think that that comfort that comes with finding a home in yourself or this world invites and evokes an emotion that transcends happiness. And I think it's it's what we would call joy. It's a vibrancy. It's a warmth. It's a love of life that I think we can only express when we find that home in ourselves and we find that home in this world. It's beautiful. And kind of is sort of starts where goes back to where we started, which was 
that you didn't feel as a child at home in yourself. And now as a young woman, you're still young, you have found that and through that for everything that we work on, but through that, you've been able to share that with others and share that with us today and with me. And so I will say that from listening to your TED Talk, from reading your book, that is the theme that is so embedded in what you've done. And I hope that you'll continue to share your joy because it is one of those things that if you share joy, the ripples become waves and other people become connected through that kind of feeling. And it makes people feel good. Joy is, I think, the necessary fuel of life, but it's also the necessary fuel for change. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining me. Thank you. This has been fun. This was great. Yeah. Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Ciao.